Well, good evening and welcome to our President's Associates Dinner featuring Dr. Yang Zhao. We're thrilled to welcome you back to campus and we hope you enjoy tonight's festivities. We're honored to collaborate this evening with Dean Greg Garn and the Janine Rainbolt College of Education. Because for 40 years, the President's Associates Program has united alumni who share a collective passion for OU. I'd like to thank all of our President's Associates members who are, are here tonight and our members of the President's Associates Council because our members invest in OU because they care and their investment allows President Gallagher to use vital resources to enhance our mission. Our President's Associates investments are game changers and sometimes life-saving investments for our students, faculty, and staff. I'd also like to welcome a special group, the George Lynn Cross Heritage Society members. Those are generous donors who've made a provision to honor OU and their estate. On your tables, you'll see a small white card. If you want to learn more about the President's Associates Program or the George Lynn Cross Heritage Society, just fill it out and leave it on the table and we'll be sure to follow up with you. Also on your table, you'll find some information about Eunice Oboy and Michelle Gutierrez, who are recipients of our President's Associates RISE scholarships. If you haven't had a chance to read about them, please do. They're remarkable young women and they happen to be with us here tonight. My name is Jill Hughes and I am a Sooner fan. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, my last job this evening is to introduce one more special guest. Jim Gallagher was installed as the 14th president of the University of Oklahoma on July 1st of 2018. He's a 1977 alumnus of the OU College of Law and our first ever CEO from a Fortune 500 company to lead OU. He has a distinguished track record and he encourage us, encourages us to pursue excellence in all we do. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs and of course his JD here from OU Law. He's a native of Canada and he's married to his lovely wife, Janet, for about mm, 40 years it's been. They have four lovely daughters. Excuse me, they have three lovely daughters, four grandchildren, and this weekend, Jim will play the important role of father of the bride. Please help me welcome our president, Jim Gallagher. great to be with all of you today. Yes, I get to be father of the bride on Saturday. My youngest daughter, Kim, is getting married to a wonderful young man. It's so exciting to get all of our family together because so many of my brothers and sisters come to those events. There's 10 children in our family, so we have a big wedding if only our family comes. <laughs> One of the things that we did is move so many times as a family. My father was an enlisted man in the Air Force, and it seemed about every two to three years we'd be at a new post. And in that process, there are always routines. When you come from a big family, you live with routines. Otherwise, things don't come together. One of the routines that my father had every time we moved was to get out a saw and build a library. He would take two by fours and get his hammer out and, and build a very crude, but very important library no matter where we lived. When you move as a enlisted person in the military, you're only allowed to take so few important possessions. But in the weight limit, my father always included his favorite books. And those favorite books were always books on philosophy, the best authors of the world, and there would always be 10, 15, 20 boxes, depending upon what point in our family we were moving. And those books were so very, very special to him. My father was 
in the military, but he had this dream of being an educator someday. And in fact, after he retired with 25 years as a senior master sergeant, he decided to go to college. He was in his 40s and a very non-traditional student. He was a C student in a small school in rural Iowa. And yet he decided to go to college after all of those years to pursue his dream to be an educator. Of course, at that point, I was a young teenager. I was in high school. And I told him that was such a bad idea. He had all these kids to support. And he should not be going to college. Well, I told you about those books because my father had a vision for each one of his children. And he truly was a great educator in a special way. When I was a young man, he decided I was going to be good in business someday. And he would have me charting stocks on the weekend. He would have me reading magazines like Forbes and all oh, Barron's and all these other things and working on the stock portfolio. He thought I would be a CEO someday, and it turned out he was right. And each one of his children, he did the same kind of special treatment to figured out their unique skills and opportunities and honed those through the years and always made sure we read the greatest of books. He went to college and finished in two and a half years magna cum laude. He would take 30 semester hours a semester, and yet he would get straight A's. And he was one of these unique people who had a passion for education. And he used to always say when he graduated, if you ever see a teacher, give him a big hug. They deserve it. And so as I came back from being a CEO to following in my father's footsteps, to be an educator, it was because of that you need to give every teacher a hug. But there's more important things than just a hug. Because here at the University of Oklahoma, we want to make sure that we support our faculty in many ways, that we support educators in many ways, that we support students in many ways. So if you look at the priorities that I've had since I've come back as president, first and foremost, I've said our students should have the opportunity for an affordable education. And so we froze tuition. We just didn't increase tuition for the first time in 10 years, less than a month ago. And we we're trying very, very hard to ensure that our great education at OU is affordable to everyone. So important. The other thing we said is after our teachers, our faculty had not had raises for close to five years, that that was an absolute top priority. And while I've said that the financials are a bit strained, I've also said we cannot afford not to give these educators fair pay because we depend on them in our classroom to do the great work that they do. The dedication that they have should be rewarded and we should pay them fairly. So those have been the first and highest priorities of what we've been trying to accomplish since I've been here. And we have given the raises we've had, held tuition flat. Now, to do that, we've had to focus on the other part of a university, the more business side, we've had to control our costs, all in the goal of putting our first priority first, which is the classroom. The other thing that I wanted to do when I came to the university is make sure we build out the second half of who we are. We have an absolute stunning campus here, and there has been so much that's been accomplished over the last couple of decades. We have beautiful place, one of the most beautiful campuses, so many new buildings, so many things that give us the opportunity to build upon a perfect foundation for growth. And the place we need to focus next is on the graduate programs. And so I put a great deal of emphasis on that part of our university and have asked so many of our faculty to not only teach in the classroom, but also spend time in the lab and spend time in the graduate programs on research and scholastic activities and writing, publishing, all of those kinds of things that bring the prestige to our university. And I've said, let's double that activity in the next five years. And so far, in these first months, we are already at a pace up 20% from any prior period we've ever had. And so people have responded brilliantly to that challenge. And we are on course to get that done. I met some of you in the rumor at the medical campus. 
and we're so proud of that. That's a huge part of what OU is, and there my challenge is, let's make OU medicine available to all in Oklahoma. We want doctors who are not only in the clinic, but also in the classroom and in the lab, and that's the best kind of medical treatment you could ever have. Let's work on a hub and spoke concept and make that kind of medicine available to all Oklahomans. And in this short period of time, we have an NCI designated cancer hospital in the top 2% in the nation from nothing, not many years ago, to absolutely brilliant today. And Harold Hamm and his foundation have donated now close to $50 million to do the same kind of thing for diabetes research. And day in and day out, there's so many other subjects that we've done so well at that complex. And there is a great opportunity for us to do even more. We have also talked about the opportunities in Northeast Oklahoma. People have said that the education system in Northeast Oklahoma is a bit fragmented, and we want to be part of any solution that the leaders in that community want. We, are, we stand prepared to go and help be part of that solution because we know that an OU education is the best you can possibly do, not only in this state, but in my view, anywhere. My father was an educator. He was so proud of the teachers that he had as, as sons and daughters. Two of my brothers, one of my sisters are teachers, have been their whole career. I think I may be a teacher now. I'm trying really hard. I'm going to be in law school teaching oil and gas law next year, one of my favorite subjects when, when I was here, a uh, career that I pursued through the years. This work that you support as president's associates is so incredibly vital, and I can't do enough to thank you for all that you do to help us. You truly are my partners in this endeavor. I get asked every day, what are the priorities in fundraising? And that is so simple. Scholarships for our students. Scholarships. Stipends for our graduate students. And finally, fellowships and other forms of endorsement for our faculty. We are investing in human capital at this point because our bricks and mortar, our campus is beautiful, it's in great shape. It's all about our people from this point forward. It's all about our educators and our students. And thank you so very much for all you do that support that vital mission. Thank you. Enjoy your dinner, and our program will start in just a bit. Thank you for joining us tonight. I, I appreciate everybody uh, bringing out their heavy winter coat with the uh, less than ideal weather, but I think you'll be incredibly impressed at our speaker tonight. My name is Greg Garn. I'm the Dean in the Janine Rainbow College of Education here at the University of Oklahoma, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Yang Zhao is the Foundation's Distinguished Professor in the School of Education with a joint appointment in the School of Business at the University of Kansas. He's also the Global Chair Professor of Education at the East China Normal University, the Global Chair Professor at the University of Bath in the United Kingdom, and a Professorial Fellow at the Mitchell Institute of Education and Policy at Victoria University in Australia. So I think we truly have a global educator here. <laughs> I think if my math is correct, is correct, he's got appointments on four of the seven uh, continents. So South America, Africa, and Antarctica, and you'll have it, all, uh, have it all there. Dr. Zhao has served in academic positions at a number of distinguished universities, including the University of Oregon and Michigan State University. His publications are incredible. Over 100 articles and 30 books, including his most recent book, Reach for Greatness, Personali Personalizable Education for All Children. Dr. Zhao's work focuses on the implications of globalization and technology for education. 
In his view, each learner should be treated as an individual with their own talents and aptitudes. He advocates for a strength-based approach and celebrates uniqueness in contrast with a deficit model reinforced by traditional assessment and efforts to produce learners who simply conform to perfect profile success set by a, a, a rigid curriculum. Please help me welcome to the stage Professor Yang Zhao. Thank you, Dean Garn. It's, it's great pleasure to be here in, uh, in Oklahoma. As I was uh, arriving here yesterday, I just noticed that I was talking to Kathy how wrong I was. I thought you guys have no water here, but apparently there was water on the road. It was slippery yesterday. It was because uh, I was in Chicago. Chicago was actually dry. That was quite. quite I was. Uh, quite surprised with this and uh, so it's been a great pleasure to have this and also I, I was had a chance to talk to the president and uh, before he announced this they actually did not understand what president's associates mean anyway basically you are the ones who give money pe to people that, that, <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting title but thank you for doing that it's a, a, so when I was said you got to speak to the president's associates dinner I said who are the associates you know, I'm glad you have associates. That's a good thing to have, you know, it's a, especially when they give money. It's a good idea. Uh, well, the, the dean was introducing me about me, about all the things I've done. I, I do kind of travel to different countries uh, because I'm in education, I do the business. But I really want to first I want to let you know how I got here. Why do I care about education in different ways? It was uh, the reason, this is actually the house I was born into in China, Sichuan province, in very rural area. My father still lives there. Uh, he's 92 now, he's, uh, he's illiterate. And uh, so the reason I'm here is really because I was so bad at doing what the village wanted me to do. So you got to be bad at something in order to do something good. I was no good. So in my village, if you were in my village in China in the 1960s, the state requirements, the standards, the testing, okay, whether if you had SAT or any scores, testing, you would have been driving the water buffalo. That was the big thing. That was the required curriculum for all the boys in my village. I was so bad that my father said, why don't you go to school? <laughs> so, so that's what happened. That's what I, truly what happened. So it's a, well, so I said, you know, I, it was no good. And then he is very happy. He did not give me remediation no remedial courses, just, just give up on me, just go, go to school. That's how it happened. It's a, so you got to learn how to run away from something you're truly bad at. That's, 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 that's what education should be. We should be allowed to run away from something you're bad at. You know, they, uh, another reason I'm here because uh, uh, I, I was bad at math. Seriously, you know, Chinese people can be bad at math, it's possible. <laughs> And so they are, in 1982, uh, I took the college entrance exam. I got uh, three out of 100. Now, that's bad if you know math. <laughs> that's, 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 uh, and um, so when I asked to choose your major, uh, that the Chinese policy says, if you choose to major in foreign languages, we'll forgive your math. I didn't know what the logic was, but assuming, maybe they're assuming nobody else knows math better than the Chinese, you know. We send math, bad math people deal with others. That's, that's fine. But then later I learned, that's not a, I was not the worst math person. So I uh, recently had a chance to talk to Jack Ma, many of me know, the founder of Alibaba. Because he's trying to build a new school, he wants me to advise him. So we, we talked, I, I kind of did some research on him. I wrote him about him in my book. He said, we took the college entrance exam in the same year, and he got a one out of a hundred. You know, that's worse than three, okay. And so both of us decided to major in English. Both of us become English teachers. The only problem between me and him, I was two points higher than him. Otherwise, I would have found another Alibaba or something like that. It's, you know, but the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that I think in education, very often, we we'll always look at what other pe what people cannot do, and define them with that. Uh, that may used to be useful, 
but today we may be different. I think today education faces massive challenges everywhere. Higher education, to K-12 education since today, and I'm, I'm glad all associates will look at you as the supporters of higher education. But higher education, more than ever, is facing huge challenges. You know, I've, uh, I've worked at different universities. I've worked at the Michigan State University. I, I was a graduate of the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and University of Oregon, now Kansas. Everybody is facing big challenges. You know, we used to call state colleges, state universities. No longer, you know, we, you know then we become a kind of state-sponsored universities now. I mean, a few years will be state-located universities because they will not get any money, you know. University of Kansas, we just faced a 20% budget cut, you know, just, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not doing well. But th that's not the biggest challenge, honestly. The, what biggest challenge we have is technology. Technology basically has rendered a lot of, a lot of, a lot of jobs obsolete, displaced. A lot of our graduates today are not fully employed. I know many of you may not know this. You look at our state, our unemployment rate is very low, but actually the underemployment is very high. Underemployment is like you, you, let's say you are a Shakespeare major, but you're driving the Uber. Yeah, sounds cool, but actually we don't need you to study, have studied Shakespeare to, to drive the Uber. It's the same thing like my daughter is studying philosophy and English literature, but she enjoys work in the bar in Edinburgh, which is, we kept telling her, you don't need a degree to do it. But she said, well, philosophy actually helps, you know, just in, in work in the bar, you know, you pour a pint, that actually is helpful. You know, it's a, a, we don't know, but it might, might be useful. But so the, the whole idea about underemployment, which I was talking to Kathy and Don about this one is, uh, you know what we have today? We have what I call the boomerang generation. You know, we used to have our kids Graduate, they go live by themselves. Now kids don't do that anymore. You threw them out, they come back to you. That, that's, that's, that's called the boomerang generation. That is a huge problem, and that problem is being perpetuated actually by university today. Not your university with this president, some other universities, okay. <laughs> now, that, that. You know, the, 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 the big reason is, is that we have not accepted the fact that technology has changed our society, and however we're trying to make our students, do, I mean, whatever we're trying to prepare them for does not exist anymore. I'm sorry to tell you that. It's the, this is happening. We don't recognize that enough. We kept encouraging our children to get more education. The problem is that more is the right education. And we basically right now have a global talent mismatch. If you go to global recruiting companies, we can't find the people we want. At the same time, we have so many people who live in their parents' basement, and they refuse to live. live. And that's the talent mismatch. That's really the big number one. And the, the reason is, I, I can just show you this whole thing, it's, uh, it's very simple. It's called technology revolution. You get jobs like this, they're gone. And this is getting worse. It's called artificial intelligence. It's coming up, the fourth industrial revolution. But very few of our schools have acknowledged that fact we keep preparing people for something that's out there and and this by the way since we have presidents associates here assume you're important people so I'm going to tell you worse problems than I have told the teachers okay the the problem with this is that degree inflation is happening everywhere we simply have too many college graduates since 1970s it's been inflated and also, the talent mismatch is forcing different companies not to hire based on degrees. And our children are misguided into universities to study for a degree and hopefully to look for a job when they should be creating jobs. So how do we deal with this? I don't think, part of my research is on entrepreneurship education. And I'll be advocating for entrepreneurship education. This is like in a book I wrote for since K-12. Entrepreneurs are a mind of thinking, it's a mindset. It's not actually to be around a business. There are all kinds of entrepreneurs. You have business entrepreneurs, you have social entrepreneurs, you have entrepreneurs, you have 
polished entrepreneurs. It's the entrepreneur spirit that you do not wait for solutions to a problem. So I, I contrast the different the, between entrepreneur mindset and employee mindset. Entrepreneurs get excited by problems. When they find a problem worth solving, that's business opportunity, that's thinking. Employee mindset, when they say a problem, they blame their boss. Okay. So actually, I love seeing entrepreneurs when they say something, they really get excited. You guys know that? I mean, sitting here, a lot of you are entrepreneurs. When you say something not working, it's, I'm going to make a profit off that. That's entrepreneur thinking. And others come, I mean, I'm going to call the mayor. Why the haven't you fixed it? That's the difference. Entrepreneurs come up with creative solutions. That's another thing. Entrepreneurship, by the way, just marketing something doesn't cut it. You need to be creativity and invention-based entrepreneurship so you can disrupt somebody. Our schools don't teach that. Our school don't teach our kids to identify problems worth solving. Our kids don't even teach our kids to solve problems creatively. We demand our students, K-12 and higher ed alike, to give, to find answers to existing problems and give the answer back in the way we want them to give. Basically, our schools is a place to destroy creativity. I'm going to show you this idea. That K-12. By the way, this happens in other states, not in Oklahoma, not under your watch. Okay, somebody else problem. Okay, it's the now. If you look at edge, because creativity, solving creative problems, entrepreneur thinking. Age five, ninety-eight percent of our children are creative at the genius level. I mean, genius level. Ninety-eight percent. Everybody is creative. After five years in our schools, other people's schools, not your schools, after five years, we lose 60-some percent. At age 10, only 32 percent are left to be creative at the genius level. Another five years, we got 10 percent left. So this is the kind of mark. If you look, go through this then. 98, 32, age 44, that's 2 percent left. After retirement, your creativity can bounce back. Do you guys all have hope? <laughs> now, why is that? Just think, think about this thing. Because our school teaches our children to be compliant, reward people who give back answers, not the ones who challenge all of us. Actually, this is called, we call the creativity slump by third grade. That happens almost every place. It's a... And so this is one way of thinking. But another problem in our education is that when we have technology like this and replace it by this, we need the human beings to be okay, more unique. You know, but we, however, universities, we accept children. I'm, I'm, today I'm kind of criticizing universities because the president's here. I don't get to speak to presidents all the time. But so I'm going to launch this criticism, see if you guys can fix it. And now, <laughs> is when we admit students, we admit them based on average. We don't admit them based on their unique profile. So if you look at any of the data, uh, we can see some of this data is quite interesting. Uh, SAT and SAT have never predicted student success. SAT, SAT and, and actually, or, uh, or other things, like you know, if you go through that. Uh, this is a number of studies. None of these average scores, composite scores, even plus GPS, don't predict student success. But we continue to take them. Why? Because they're simple. It's easy. It's lazy. Okay. How, how, what makes you successful as a person, as a student, is what makes you unique. Because none of this treat every student as a unique person. They treat you basically as carry some scores. You can do something. And that has a, a too bad result. One is result is we have a lot of excellent ship. This is a Yale University professor, former guy, actually an English professor, wrote this book. It was really good to say, we have a lot of students wasting their time, energy, trying to lose their creativity, entrepreneur thinking to collect gold stars to become the best students you admit me. That's one thing. Another thing, we unnecessarily reject minorities based on their SAT scores. And we un that's unnecessary because 
We think we have a doing affirmative action. We believe SATs predicts, but our minorities, African Americans, Latinos, typically have an average lower about 20 points on SAT. But it doesn't matter. If it didn't matter, why do you keep them away? So, so when the university need a diversity of talents, we never look for that. So how do we admit, how do we select our students matters because in the future, again, we need people to be extremely and diverse and individual and different. So we talk about entrepreneur thinking. Are you a job finder or seeker or are you a job creator? I believe our students who are privileged them, 80% of the people in the world are students. They should be leading the job creation, not job seeking. And the best job you can have, most secure job, is the one you create for yourself. That, that, that's typical. Another thing I always say, okay, no, I, I didn't used to drive cars. I used to drive water buffaloes. I was bad at that. So when I came to America, I, I decided to be in a driver's seat, is, you never get car sick. If you are the driver of change, you don't get car sick. So I'd rather be the driver and the passenger of change, of new possibilities. How do we lead that, that piece is key. And diversity is also key. But also there's more information about this. I was talking about, about how we have to be responsible. Because this is it's nothing new. This is the essence, is a natural process of, of uh, human history. That is when you <laughs> it's interesting, an economics book, it's called The Race Between edu Education and Technology. It's by two Harvard economists, Claudia Golden and Lillian Katz. They basically trace technology and education. Very simple. Whenever new technology comes up, accumulates to a revolution, it redefines, drastically redefines the value of talents and knowledge. What used to be useful, becomes less useful. You know, the uh, Google car is coming. Remember those driverless cars coming? There's those autonomous driving cars. It's actually not coming. It's, they're, they're on the road right now. Actually, if you go to Nevada, they have those autonomous driving trucks right there. It's happening. It's not in nothing new. You know, how many jobs are we going to lose? Millions of jobs. Millions of jobs. And then the question is, when do you lose jobs, there are new possibilities coming up. The question is, are you able to take advantage of new possibilities? But new possibilities require different kind of education. So I had an um, interesting mental exercise with a bunch of, bunch of people, excuse me to say, if we don't need a driver, human driver, what new jobs will be there? Imagine the jobs will, will lose, because cars have been serving the human driver. So when you don't need a human driver, you don't need the steering wheel. You don't need traffic lights. You don't need the gas pedals. You don't need all of those secured reasons. Things. But how many more jobs are we going to lose? But at the same time, what kind of jobs are we going to create? Have you thought about that? Well, I know one thing. You can drink without being arrested. For sure. That's, that's, you, that's, so I would get into bar design for cars. That's a huge new, new one, you know. Who are you going to arrest? You're going to arrest Google? You know, can't, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm doing my thing, you know. It's, uh, no, I think car interior design will be very hot. But who is running business like that? Who is doing a major like that? You can imagine. Another part, I, think, I bet personalized service will be big. You don't need garages. You don't need parking. Cars will drive themselves, park in different places. So cars will not be a sense of ownership, but become service. But can you provide unique service? Might be really interesting. I don't know. I just think about there will be new possibilities. But are we really predicting, helping our children to think through the whole process? The race is quite significant if we don't do it right. When technology pulls ahead too far ahead, education doesn't catch up. What you have is basically results in income inequality. The few wealthy people get very wealthy because education. Education never creates the super wealthy. Education serves the middle class. We always create the middle class. So we always put resource into the middle class. And mid the middle class is the bedrock of America. And we've been losing that, that bedrock. And uh, 
you, 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 some of you may be aware, aware of this data that since the 1970s, we've been, uh, our economy has changed. This is what they call the shrinking middle class. You look at 1970s, we had a lot more middle class until the 2000s, we don't have as many middle class. The shrinking is very quite scary, this data to show that it's continuing. And this is why it caused a lot, lot of economical and political turmoil. And this is not only happening in the US, this is a global phenomenon because education has failed to catch up to the technology redefinition of human talents. We continue to teach and judge our children based on the paradigm of Henry Ford and not trying to shift in our thinking. And this, this e economical sh shifting, you know, for example, US, we blame the loss of manufacturer jobs to other countries. We kept blaming China, for example. China is blaming Vietnam. <laughs> and Vietnam is complaining about Bangladesh. You know, it's a, there's plenty of people to go around. What, what happens, this economical job move around, it happens. And it's more technology take a lot, lot of more jobs away that simple in other countries. And plus, you can't claim other countries don't deserve to develop. Right? You, you, can, you can't run countries like that. Economic things doesn't work that way. So in any ways, what I would like to say, because in the US, if you look at how much we invest in education, in the US, we spend about $120,000 per 12 years for average. You know, if you use that much money, $100,000 to what it, 10,000 to 100,000, that makes you top 25% wealthiest people in the world. It means if you did not do anything, our kids, save their money in public schools, give the kids, they'd be automatically wealthier than 75% of people. And that money should buy us a lot more than simple test scores. I think our country, so that's, but our country in America not only hasn't caught up, we have been chasing the wrong way. You know, you read a lot of newspapers saying, American education needs reform. We need a change. This is why since 1980s, actually since 1958, we thought our education was worse than Soviet Union, then was Japan, then China. We've been complaining about American education is getting worse. That's why we need reform. So is American education getting worse or not? So I did some research. I said, American education, I found, is not getting worse, is not in decline, it has always been bad. <laughs> if you measure by test scores, if you look at test scores, you know, in the 1960s, Americans 12th graders ranked 12th out of 12 countries in the first international math. Now that's again pretty bad if you know math. 12th out of 12 countries, it's a, but then you go on, 60s, 70s, 90s, 2000s, we've never scored well. American education is never about test scores. But how come America is still here? That's a question. I'm not guaranteed I'll be here forever. I think American education was pretty good, but we've been risen to the past. We've been trying to learn from other countries, like from Finland, from China, from Singapore. Those countries, they don't have the good education. They had an education that produced test scores. But test scores has no indication of future success. It's actually worse. And recently, you know, there's a speak of intelligence. I mean, there's a, a test, actually in Japan, for example, a professor just created a robot that did better than 80% of students on the University of Talk entrance college exam. But you can buy robots to get your test scores. They're gonna solve the problems. So we need to, we need to have this massive shift in how we think about education. So overall, I would like to make a read a few suggestions for us to think about in education. Technology gives us huge promise for humanity, but technology also drives us to rethink about education. And where does that lie? I think it's, uh, we need first of all accept that this is the proportion of percentage of workers work at different times over the last 200 years. 1800, you said the green line, it's a lot of people working in agriculture. Then most of them are replaced by large scale assembly line workers. Now, since 1970s, we see that decline of employment. People become, a lot of them become actually the gig economy, solo workers, the service industry, 
and creative industry. We have creative class. But our education has not deliberately created that. So it's a couple of things. Number one, can our schools, every school, K-12, higher education, rethink what education is about? Education is not about equipping students with predetermined skills and knowledge as we do now. Those can be accessed easily online. You know, it's virtual. Those simple knowledge can be easily acquired. I'm sure you guys have, uh, your Thanksgiving dinner has improved because of YouTube, right? It's, you're not dealing with your grandma's recipe anymore. You probably have changed those things. So that's something that, and number two, we cannot treat everybody as average person anymore. Our educational research so far and psychological research showing that people are different, people are unique, and each job in the future requires a unique combination of talents, interests, and passion, and not the same. Traditionally, those assembly line jobs require people to be the same. The difference only lies in quantity, not in quality. In the future, we actually have a lot of, lot of opportunities for people to create jobs, and they have to be able to create those jobs. And also, technology happens to provide that opportunity. But I have to tell you, most technology users in schools have in universities, too, are in the wrong sense, in the wrong way. They used to manage kids with data, and they used to drill kids more, you know, in terms of learning more, mastering more. But technology really should be used to allow students to personalize learning. Big classrooms, big classes should disappear. There shouldn't be any lectures. I, I don't know about OU. Oh, uh, Again, your professors may be better than other professors. Most of lectures are a waste of time. Most of lectures. I don't know if you've been to lectures. You know, 300 people. Why do you do that? Just go watch a video. You know, it's much more interesting. You can watch in multiple languages too. You know, just if you are interested in that thing. It's why do you, I mean, I, I, I don't think any large lectures are good enough to do this. this thing. Why do you do that? Oh, that? Number one, okay. And another thing is that, because you can do differently. And teachers, professors need to become much more human mentors and coaches. We need to shift the whole thinking. And also universities need to be a lot more, and actually schools, we should always start our education through asking children and college students to become, a, be able to create value for others. That's true in entrepreneurship. That means I see a problem, I'll fix it for you, I create value for you, henceforth I have the reason to exist in the world. So I want to bring it back together. Technology brings great hope if education can catch up to it, can create the kind of people who can take advantage of new possibilities. And all technology can be a huge danger if we use it wrongly. Technology itself has no ethical decision. It depends on how we use it and how we help our children use it. I know there's something really kind of strange and ironic that whenever we have a new wave of technology, we either blame it or endorse it. Now, in education, we always commit this big mistake in education. And we invest a lot of money in technology. We're hoping technology is going to solve our problem. Do you notice that actually that's not happening? That's not true. Many of our schools now are facing the problem of technology. We spend millions, billions of dollars connecting our kids to the internet. We spend a lot of money banning them from the internet. Right? They say, no, you can't get on the way. No smartphones. It's, that's strange. It's not, not, that's not a problem. The problem is what kind of education philosophy we have. Do we value every child as independent, creative, entrepreneur individuals, or do we treat them as robotics and we want to return them to become mechanical devices? That's the choice we face, and that's how we're going to determine the humanity in the future. Thank you. Sky Singleton, who is, um, in, as an undergraduate, she was named the Outstanding Senior from the School of Music. She is now a recipient of the Marilyn Horn Award and pursuing her doctoral degree in voice in the College of Music, 
would you please welcome Sky Singleton to help us with the OU chant. Shut 